Welcome back to Venshon Denshon, my YouTube channel. And today, my guest is Janet Gale, who is principal at Campbell Primary School. And it's not a stretch of the imagination to say that if I'm recording these interviews, Janet is a little bit responsible for me being able to do it. And I'm going to quickly elaborate what I mean by that. I'm now a maths teacher, a leading teacher in maths for the Victorian High Ability Program. And the only reason I was able to get that job is because of the year and a half that I worked at Camberwell and the immense support and mentoring that I got from Janet. And because I'm in this job at Victorian High Ability Program, that's also giving me the space to get back into trumpet playing. And thus this whole series of interviews were born. So it's with enormous pleasure that I introduce you to Janet Gale, my friend and mentor. It's wonderful to be here. And I have to say, Jeff, that I've really enjoyed the series. Uh, it's been fascinating discovering different aspects of you, because I think that's what it is when we meet someone that we can't always imagine their past. So it's been a real delight and it's an honor to be here too. <laughs> And well, it's an honor for me to have you here. And with my music, with my musical guests, I start often by asking them about memorable concerts that they performed in. But as a lifelong educator, I've been thinking about what the parallel will be. And I guess it would be if you could share some of the memorable moments, either with students or aha moments, or really moments in your career that stand out and why they stand out for you? Uh, I've had a very rich career that sort of um, covered many different professions. So I started with education and I started in an open plan learning environment in Auckland in an underprivileged area. And it was really about, I mean, I'm in education because of the fact that it's, uh, the hope of making a better world for our children and preparing our children for making a better world. So I started in this very underprivileged area and I can remember in this open plan space, trying to understand what education was really about. And it has taken me all of these years really to come to my, my understanding of education and the very fact that it's about taking I, I actually had this little boy in 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 prep way back in 19 what was it 1980 1979 1980 and he was a, a Polynesian prince had hair all the way down his back in this beautiful plait and he had never learned to follow instructions because he was a five-year-old prince. So it was this interplay between a student's rights and the routines that they required to actually enable them to learn and the knowledge that we hope to impart, but also the joy and delight that we wanted them to uh, discover about learning. And he was my challenge. Uh, I don't think I made it with that little boy, but I can remember in foundation, at Camberwell Primary School, teaching bilingually, teaching in French, which isn't my native language, and the challenge, you know, having to sing and dance and act just to try and hope that the children understood what you were saying because you provided that an authentic learning environment. And after six months teaching mostly monolingual English speaking children, in French, one of the little boys, and I can remember him so well. Halfway through the year, he, he started talking to me. He started making his own sentences in foundation in French. And it was just that light bulb moment of, it works, <laughs> which was wonderful because it's such a difficult endeavor teaching bilingually, as you know. But that was a real light bulb moment for me with that sort of journey of really making it relevant to the child, which was great. And I have to admit another fabulous moment recently in education for me was, was you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, um, it was 
you, we'd been having a conversation over your first year at school and science and and you know you'd done an amazing job and you had the children singing the periodic timetable and everybody was raving about science and yet it wasn't the place for you it just wasn't a good fit and and so you said that you were looking elsewhere and I said well I'd support you you know no matter what you want to do that's that's what's crucial you've got to be satisfied in your work and then and then we had our retirement function and for two of our wonderful colleagues and we had a lot of ex-colleagues who came back for that very simple but meaningful and lovely evening and so many people walked back and they said oh we feel as though we're coming home and the next day you said that you'd stay you'd changed your mind and that it was because of the culture that we had at Camberwell Primary School and I have to say that meant a lot that really meant a lot because you know um, running a school isn't easy and getting that sort of feedback was was a gem <laughs> so they're the two little items that I'd say I'd mention well I don't know if everyone can see, I am actually wearing my Camberwell, <laughs> my year six hoodie to, at the moment that you kindly gave me when I moved on to VHAP. And I still feel part of Camberwell, I do. And I'm really, really excited that this term in one of my VHAP classes, I've got yeah. a bunch of year, <laughs> year five and six kids that I'll be teaching. I'm very, very excited about that. It's interesting to me though, you didn't grow up speaking to, did you grow up just speaking English? Oh, yes. I was very monolingual. I didn't understand what being bilingual or multilingual meant. I had, I had no concept. I, I worked a lot as a young person in, um, in humanitarian movements with people from different cultures. But, and I travelled as a young woman quite, quite a lot because of... Um, humanitarian causes as well but until I lived in in Belgium and in France and in Holland and I was there for 16 years I did not understand what it meant to function in different languages and 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 how that impacted on us how how um you know as as society changes we change the language but then there's that other real richness to language that the very structure of the language impacts on the way that we think and for me that was a revelation and with french and english all of those faux amis where i thought i was saying one thing <laughs> and and i could find that i was saying something completely different and sometimes incredibly embarrassing but it was a revelation. And I've always loved language and I love literature. So to try and explore the way that the brain works and benefits from being bilingual, but also how we impact on each other, those conversations that we have that take on a different hue from one language to another. I don't know, I just find it fascinating. But even still from there, to becoming a real champion of bilingual education. I want to, I want to dig a bit deeper into that because <laughs> I've known you since I've only known you for the last three or four years. And I've always, I've known you as, you know, someone who has read the research, been part of the process of it becoming something, but you don't just, you did, you, that's not an immediate thing. So how did you, from this, understanding that you know bilingualism is useful and good how did you then become such a champion for bilingual education well after coming back from Europe I was very fortunate to find out about Camberwell Primary School and at that time I was thinking of changing from my profession in art to going back into education so really Camberwell was a lucky lucky stroke to actually find it and working there, I started off as an assistant and then went in, into uh, returning to teaching once I'd decided that that's what I wanted to do. 
we really had this funny sort of a situation being such an, an anomaly in education and in Victoria, where we needed to advocate for the group of 11 or 12 schools that are funded as bilingual schools in Victoria, which is amazing. But we need to really prove, we had to always prove what we were doing and we had to prove it to the parents that were coming in as well. Because years ago, people used to opt to come into Camberwell and if they didn't, weren't keen on bilingual education, they could access a different school. But over the years, we've really had to meet the needs of every child coming in uh, to the school because now, as all of the other schools are at capacity, there's really no choice. If, if you live in a uh, you know, uh, designated neighbourhood zone, you're stuck with bilinguals. So we really needed the evidence. And obviously, all of the research shows that the benefit of the bilingual brain is that you know, you're a better problem solver, you're a better risk taker, you develop really great metacognitive skills and great metalinguistic skills. But what we realized through the type of teaching and learning that we were uh, putting into practice by having uh, the dual classroom situation and repeating lessons twice in our very complex timetable is that we were ended up teaching those skills explicitly. And so we were maximizing the bilingual benefit and we think that's why our data has been so exceptional over the years. And um, so, yeah, we've been, you know, looking into the research done in Canada and America, especially. There's an amazing scientist, um, neuroscientist in France, I think his name is Dehaene, who has studied the bilingual brain and where language is, um, is acquired if you're a, uh, if you learn as a child or as an adult and the way that the, the brain actually works. So I literally became more and more fascinated with, with the endeavor that we were engaged in and realized that um, one of my goals as an educator is, as I said, to really future-proof children for this crazy world that we're putting them out into and that by learning bilingually they actually become a better learner and that that uh, I, I really do believe that we're giving them an added advantage sorry the neighbors cutting the lawn no problem <laughs> but that, yeah but that we're ad actually adding another advantage that children don't get in other schools and and I think we're very fortunate in Australia as well, especially in Victoria, but with, you know, with visible learning, with John Hattie's uh, approach to teaching and learning combined with bilingual education, the more that we make to our students, the fact that there is a bilingual benefit, the more that they'll be able to access that. So it's sort of been an evolution really of of research and understanding and practice, you know, seeing the kids when they come in in foundation and they sit there looking at you as though you're some sort of a weird um, alien. And by, the, you know, by year six, you've got students functioning really at a high level in another language. It's rather exceptional. We're very fortunate. It is amazing. In the year that I taught uh, science at Camberwell and I did a, a school-wide uh, inquiry into climate change and the yeah. presentations that they came up with in, in all of the years, but particularly the high years, they were, you know, delivering passionate um, views and they made movies and they wrote scripts and they sang all in French. It was really quite exceptional and not... And what I find really inspiring is not just the ones who come from French speaking backgrounds, but some of the kids who had French, not as even a second, but as a third language. And when they come on board, what I like to call the magic carpet ride, then it's very inspiring. But I will also say hard work, very, very hard work. And I wanna talk more about that a bit later, but I think it's, you said you started off as an assistant and what was the, the pathway from assistant to principal? How did that work? Well, well, you see what 
happened for me was uh, I trained in New Zealand, which I have to say was an amazing teacher training, very holistic, very progressive at the time, way back when, and, um, and taught in, in Auckland before moving with my husband to, uh, to Europe. So I spent many years away from education. And by the time I came back, my three-year degree was no longer um, enough. I had to have a four-year degree. So I took the opportunity of doing a year of study with some fantastic educators. And um, during that year, I worked at Camberwell as an assistant in class. And that really gave me an amazing insight into the teaching and learning in a bilingual school because I went into everybody's classes basically and had that opportunity to share and um, learn from so many teachers. And then coming in, to uh, the, next, the next year I was successful in getting a place at Camberwell Primary School. But I was given, because of my experience, sort of, you know, coming in as a, a mature age teacher, I suppose, into the Australian system, I was given a curriculum role in bilingual education straight away. So I was part-time in class and part-time teaching over the next whatever number of years it was. And um, that really set me up for, um, you know, applying for assistant principal. I worked very closely with Helen Varno, our previous principal, and she was being drawn more and more into the politics of running a school. So at that stage, we were sorely uh, under-resourced with play space and uh, we were involved in quite uh, a battle to get Our Lady of Victories, which became the junior campus. So as she took on all of those roles, I took up the curriculum side of life with uh, the teaching and learning, which, you know, it was great experience for me. Also, I was very fortunate because at that time we didn't have many classrooms. So often we shared classrooms. So I co-taught with Wendy Toop and Karen Purcell and Heather Hunt. We actually were two teachers in one classroom and uh, we both had a desk and for half the day the children were taught in English and half the day they were taught in French, but it meant that we really developed a, a bilingual approach to teaching and learning. And that's where a lot of our theory came from for what we're trying to implement now was that opportunity to teach with expert English teachers in that bilingual way. So it was brilliant. So that's how I got here. <laughs> right. That's, yeah, that is fascinating. What I wonder is, and I think that this is something that many people don't realize, if you could talk a little bit about the responsibilities, what does it actually mean being the principal of a primary school? What, what do you, what are you in charge of and what do you actually have to do? Because in my roles as a classroom teacher and a science teacher and, a, and an emerging leader, I've had some, some insights into that, but I think it will be really interesting if you don't mind articulating, first of all, what it means, the responsibilities of being a principal, and then just a bit of a day in the life. Yeah. Of oh, the responsibilities. So it's enormous. Um, we have this autonomous role as far as the department is concerned, where in reality, we have the duty of care for the children and for our staff and any visitors who are on site. So we have this, as, as well as for the buildings, and, and the play space. So we have the duty of care and responsibility for everything and even offsite. So uh, even if children are outside the play, uh, the school grounds with their parents, we're still responsible for them. So it's, it's a really weird thing because you're aware of that all of the time that everything that happens within the school, any, anyone who's invited into the school, if a teacher invites a parent in to come and talk to their students, I'm actually responsible for them. So first of all, that, there's that over, um, 
overarching duty of care. But then there's every other area. So there's all of the technical areas where you're taking care of uh, future planning for the school. So currently we're looking at trying to uh, think about what other buildings will need in the future because we will need more classrooms around our school there are all these apartment blocks going up you know so we're just sort of going ah! all these families who think that they'll be able to afford um, a, to buy a house after they've bought their apartment and suddenly realize that they can't so they might as well have their children where they are and all of those children will come streaming out of the apartment blocks into Camberwell Primary School and we've got to find places to fit them in so we're already looking at the master plan going forward you know what what does that look like where will we put another three-story building and if we've got a three-story building on the tiny footprint that we've got, where can we access play space? And as you know, the Camberwell Green has been advocating for um, the government to turn a car park into a play space. And we're really hoping that that will occur, of course, because we're desperate. So there's all of that side of taking care of the structure of the school and then there's the recruitment. So recruitment's a really big part of my life. People like you come in and then go, <laughs> which is understandable and normal and to be celebrated. But for example, for, for my vision for bilingual education is for all of our students in all of our classes to be able to access deep learning where they're engaged in really rich units of work that are real life, real world, and that have a positive impact on members of the community so that they're not just learning about a little subject and then making a cute presentation on PowerPoint, but that they're actually going out into the community and working with the elderly or working you know, with the fire brigade or working with someone to do something that's going to make a change so that children can learn that they are change agents themselves. For us to be able to do that, what we need is the children to be able to really work, think, learn, articulate their thinking in French as well as in English. So this year is our first year of doing an increased immersion in foundation. So the children are learning four days in English, in French, and one day in English. And to put that in place, I've been staffing over five years to build the capacity of our stable of staff so that we've got more teachers like yourself who could teach in English or in French. And the joy of Victoria is really, there are so many people who have that capacity. We do get a lot of Canadians coming in and French and Mauritians but to have people like yourself as well, who are residents, Australian citizens, who are bilingual is critical. So I've been working towards that and it's started. We do have a few hiccups thanks to COVID, but that's okay, we'll get past that. So there's all that sort of recruitment side and recruitment's really about taking care of people as well, because you know, you've, you've got your maternity leaves, which is a really big thing in teaching as in nursing. So many um, of our staff are female, but you've also got career prospects as well. So it's about looking forward all the time for what people might be interested in and, you know, your leadership model and how that can support them as well. And then you've got parents. Parents are a really big part of a principal's life. And understandably, every parent knows a lot about education because they've been to school. And therefore, a lot of people think that they know a lot about education and can tell you what to do because they've been there and they know the answers. And often it's really challenging because education is far more complex than what a student will understand as they pass through a school. So often there's a lot of um, challenges with 
developing that sort of common understanding about education. So your parents are a big part of my life. And, and also the other aspect for parents is that their child is the most important thing in their life. And that's the way it should be. That's wonderful. And our role is to support them in understanding that we really care. Their child is important to us too. And we're on the journey with them. So it's about developing that shared understanding of the educational journey. So that's a huge cultural part of, um, of the role. And then there's gee, there's teaching as well, you know, there's the classroom practice and what's happening in class. And, and so often as a principal, you feel that you aren't there, you know, you, you sort of scrabble your way back to visiting classes and talking to teachers about their students and about their own practice. And, and really that's the golden nugget of being a principal is supporting teachers on their journey and and opening the doors for them to learn more about what you know the, I mean it's a vocation it's not a profession they love coming to school and they love being there but it's a hard gig and being in a bilingual school it's even harder so it's about trying to make that a really rich and worthwhile journey for our teachers and then there's all of the curriculum, so what we're doing. And that's really exciting because that's always evolving. So each year is never the same. It can't be and it shouldn't be, but it's fantastic. So it's about making sure that we're focusing on the right thing and moving forward in a really coherent, logical manner. So we take everybody with us. Lots of journeys. Wow. Janet. That is, I have to say that it's amazing. And what's amazing to me is that all of those vitally important strands of being a principal, they're all happening at once simultaneously. And one of the many things that I really admired and learned a lot from you was when I was briefly as a teacher member of school council, and also I was sometimes on panels with you, and I got to see these different aspects. And I was so amazed and impressed, especially it was in the first beginning of COVID last year when we were having school council meetings. And I knew that you had been at school since seven in the morning and a lot had happened, <laughs> a lot, a lot of different things had happened. And yet we're having the school council meeting and we're talking about things and you had to you had to give them their full importance and their due and of course all of the diplomatic skills that you know the diplomacy that's needed and the listening i that really used to blow me away those those school council meetings of the way you could adapt your thinking and your being so so fluently and I couldn't imagine that other than that you must have been exhausted at the time because they were very long days. The other thing that I want to highlight a little bit. Can, can I interrupt of course, there, Jim? Of course. I'd just like to say that the only way that a principal can do their job is because we're not expert in everything at all, is by having an amazing team to work with. And I feel privileged and honoured to say that I work with exceptional colleagues and it's, you know, it's not always perfect, it's not always um, easy, we're human beings, but I couldn't have got through COVID and we were literally, as was every principal, I was not exceptional. Uh, we were working seven days a week for many months, one month after another. It was incredible. But it was amazing because people from all different levels of the staff were contacting you saying, what can I do? I mean, we work in the best industry on earth, really. It's just, it's an honour to work with people. <laughs> 
you know, Canva was amazing, I have to say. Sorry to interrupt, but no, it is a you, team. No, you didn't interrupt at all because that I, I'm, I'm going to come back to the team element, but there was one other thing I wanted to just highlight, something that one of my original mentors said to me is that every student you teach is somebody's pride and joy. And you articulated yeah. that as well when you were talking about how we can honour that at the same time as all of the other things that are going on in this massive collective. I definitely agree with you about the amazing team at Camberwell and I'm still in touch with quite a few of my colleagues there and I learned a lot from all levels of 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 the staff the the teachers I worked with closely and the whole the whole system of it as yeah quite quite remarkable and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name them because then I'll, I'll leave someone out and then I'll feel bad but the the teaching yeah. staff at Campbell is truly exceptional, no doubt about that. And I think that you have to be, I mean, even in a normal school, it's hard work, but you add in the extra layer of bilingual education in terms of the timetable, in terms of the communication and the collaboration and everything, it is, I'm, yeah, I, it, it's a huge amount, but I'm sure it's worth it for the, for the outcomes for the students. I wonder, Janet, if you could just talk us through a day in the life, a day, a day of, of, of your job throughout the day, what you do. Uh, you know, I, I try to, I don't live near school, so I try to leave home just before seven. So sometimes I'm at school at seven, sometimes I'm at school at 7.30, but not after 7.30 just depends on the traffic, the joys of traffic. Um, but when I get to school, I really try to make sure that I'm ready for the day. Uh, emails are the bane of my life. I, I could shoot emails in the head, basically. I, but I have to try and skim through the emails that have come through and just identify are there any priorities, basically. Make sure that I'm ready for the meetings of the day and then usually by about 7.30, people start coming in and there are always queries about excursions, incursions, timetables, support people, challenging students. I try to uh, attend to people at the time. Otherwise, I try to give them some sort of a time frame where I can get back to them. Uh, I often have meetings with people from like representatives of parents association or school council. I try desperately to get together with the leadership team at some stage, but at the moment, for example, we have concerns about um, uh, funding. So I'm in touch with the Victorian Schools Building Association, with the local parliament parliamentary member and uh, different members of government, Department of Environment, Department of uh, Education about land specifically and buildings. Uh, we've, over the past year, we've had a, a greater diversity of students coming to our school. So there's a lot of improving our facilities for inclusive education. So we, I'm on to different um, departments about that. We're also accessing architects about, <laughs> about rebuilding our toilets because they are not in a good state. And so there's all of that sort of thing is just throughout the day. You're trying to get in touch with people. They're ringing back. You're in a meeting. You're sort of zipping in and out of things all the time. I try to get to visit a few teachers about any of their personal professional issues. And usually during the day as well, we'll have a staff meeting. So it's about being staff ready for that. And of course there's yard duty and uh, meetings with parents. I suppose that's probably a fairly normal day. I'm really fortunate because quite frankly, I've got the most amazing admin team ever. And they're the sort of people who pop in and say, have you eaten yet? So, you know, we all take care of each other, which is wonderful as well. But that's sort of quite a few days at the moment, a, a bit like that. But it, it ebbs and flows. 
because at different times it's report writing time and or it's three-way conference time and it's about making sure that everything's ready. So my job is to make sure that the school's student ready and teacher ready and parent ready and it depends what's on the timeline as far as that goes. But we also have a lot of regional meetings so you know, at least once a week, there'd be a regional meeting at the moment. They've been really supportive during COVID. So they're making sure that the information's being pumped out to us. And of course, you know, I, I need to follow up on things like the PDP uh, performance reviews and all of these processes just sort of roll along, but they're incorporated often into the into many days until they're resolved. So it's a wide panoply of um, you know so many different things amazing a couple of things i want to say first of all a huge shout out to the campbell admin team i work yeah. not, can't say worth your weight in gold worth your weight in something beyond gold because i <laughs> when i was yes. as the science teacher as well because i was just next to them i got to visit them and every now yeah. and then i would go in and say hey come and have a look what we're doing here they used to like that as well they would come in mm -hmm. and check out the experiments we were doing but the the amazing work that's done by the admin team another thing i want to give a shout out to you is about your open door style of leadership and you said that that people come and, and visit you, but I always felt, and you always made it clear that your door was open to yeah. for staff to come in. And that is incredibly empowering for staff. And it kind of leads me into my next topic I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is your leadership style. So I experienced it as very welcoming as a new teacher, encouraging and empowering but I wonder if you would talk a little bit about your conscious decisions of the way you the way you lead, the way you work with others. It's definitely very collaborative. I mean, it's you have a you have a very uh, strong group of leaders that you work with. But your own leadership style, how's that developed, and how much of it is conscious, and how much of it it just has developed like that? I think one's leadership style evolves basically. Uh, I'm sure when I started I had a concept about having to be the uh, you know authority in every area of teaching and learning and running the school and I certainly felt very self-conscious in the beginning because there was so much to learn but gradually I feel that I well I hope that I have developed a very collaborative approach to leadership. I love working in a leadership team where we are all brainstorming ideas and really coming up with the best option for the school. I find that's really invigorating and, and exciting. And, and I'm very open to the fact that I can put forward an idea and someone can turn around and go, not too sure about that, not sure if that would work at all. But and that's okay, because it's it's about finding the best outcome. So yeah, collaborative is crucial. I do try to be very transparent over the years. I've tried to really share a lot of school data with staff that hadn't been uh, shared before. So I feel that we need to understand who we are as a learning uh, teaching and learning organization and how we can improve. So transparency is critical. And I don't know, clarity and communication, I think are the, are the tough ones. And that's an evolving process. I think teachers need to know what the game plan is and it needs to be clear and consistent and coherent so that they can see the line, this, you know, the, the timeline and, and where we're going and they need to know why. So I really try to make everything purposeful and I think it's an evolving process. I'm sure I'm getting better at it. Even with documentation now, I feel as though what's being provided to staff is, is far more clear and purposeful. So collaborative, transparent and 
clarity and yeah, communication is an ongoing area of improvement. I, I hope that I'm an authority on bilingual education for the school. I certainly feel as though I have a very clear vision of where we can go. And I've, I've come to Camberwell Primary School and it's been this little anomaly bouncing along on the, on the ocean of education. And I really want us to have a very strongly built boat to be sailing along in. And so not only am I working towards this um, vision of increased immersion in the early years, and it's just in the early years, but I'm also working to develop a kindergarten so that we'll have, uh, and it, it's, in, it's in sight, it's still a lot, long way off, but it's in sight. But to have a kindergarten that is neighboring the school where the children can work with our students, the kindergarten students and the primary school students can interact. And also now we've got that benefit of, um, of the pathway to Auburn High School. And that's not for every child. So to create really good pathways to secondary, I think that's my vision is to, to leave that before I hand over to the next, the next leader. I think that's sort of where I, I fit. Yeah, so needs to be visionary, needs to be collaborative and transparent. I love the collaborative approach. So that's been an easy one. So in, it's so inspiring for me hearing you hearing you talk, Janet. So so articulate, and I mean, I didn't really give you any preparation. I'm just firing these questions out at you, and it just the fact that they're so it's so present in your mind is um, yeah, I find it really inspiring. I have one more topic that I'd like to broach very gently in my um, gender as a man, but I really would love to know. Where do you think we're at now in gender equity in education specifically? And if you like, generally in Australia, where are we now and where do we need to go? This is a topic that's quite close to my heart. Yeah, and, and to mine. And to mine. I think in education, we're very fortunate because there is such a you know predominance of, of women and in Victorian education, I don't know for the rest of Australia because I'm not Australian. I, I really don't know what's happening in, in other states. Um, I do believe that the holistic approach to educating students has been transposed also into the education of our, or the development of our leaders in education. Uh, you know, the fact that so many of our young leaders are encouraged to take part in programs through BASTO, which is uh, aligned to our universities, of course, and to get masters in education. Unlike me, um, so many principals now have masters in education. And you can see these young women who are just really finding their feet and, and flying with leadership. And so many of them have left our own school and gone out to work in other schools. And I have to say, I, I do think it's a little bit because of the complexity of our school, we create really good leaders. You have to learn so much about navigating teams and curriculum and leadership strategies that many uh, teachers pop up into the leadership level and start sort of saying, uh, I, I want a role, you know, and it's fantastic. So I, I think even though it's perhaps stronger in our own school, I think it exists in many other schools. When I started in, in Victoria, working in schools, there was talk of the boys club. And I'm very happy to say that I haven't heard about the boys club for a long, long time. So, you know, this, this right of a male, whether 
he's a classroom teacher or a specialist teacher to become AP and then principal no longer exists. It, I think we're at a stage now where we're really encouraging uh, men to come into education. If, if I, I, I imagine in a lot of schools, perhaps there still is a gender bias that the leader should be a, a male. I have to admit that probably still does exist. But I think we're in a fortunate area where we can argument for a woman to be in that place because they have equal, if not greater capacity. I think education is a good place for women to be. I, yeah, I certainly agree. I mean, my, my experience, I've been very, very lucky that I had the predominantly um, female leadership team at Camberwell, which was fantastic. And at VSV now as well, our AP is, is, is a woman and we've got an acting principal of all of VSV who's a woman as well, inspiring yeah. figures. What about in the, in the broader societal element? Where do you think we're at? Because I like to think that we're at a tipping point and that the enough is enough, that it won't just, the status quo will end, but what do you think? I, I agree. I do concur that we are at a tipping point. Uh, I think education has a huge role to play. What worries me, having come from overseas, is a cultural tendency to the, towards the macho towards the, the white boy, towards the uh, women are used as, if I can say it, as sex objects and, and um, yeah, but that's in a very broad cultural sense. And even in humor, even in Australian humor, that it, it really denigrates women. Um, I found that incredibly challenging. And we've had a situation recently which I won't go into detail, but where the parent of quite a young child was talking about how she was surprised to think that she needed to talk to her, her daughter about consent. Now, it really does, we're all responsible for raising our boys we're all responsible. And as educators, we need to stop violence against women. We just, it, it should not be such a dominant factor in our society. It is criminal and it is a shame. But we're at the coalface and we can make a huge difference. And it's really interesting. I just find it so, fascinating because you know children learn from everything that we do but you know doesn't research say that over 70 percent of what a child learns is from our body language not what from what we say not from what we do you know we could be doing the dishes but being angry about having to do the dishes and the children see that you're resentful so we really need to always be so mindful of who we are. And, and that's for all of us at every level, but especially in this area of, uh, of raising children. It, we are at a tipping point and, and Jiminy Crickets, we've got America on another tipping point with their racial tension. But Australia, I do believe we, we have some very area, huge areas to focus on with our Indigenous people and with, um, with gender equity. It's huge, but it's at the forefront. It needs to be at the forefront of our minds. I don't that, have the answer though. <laughs> I think that you've, I think education, we as educators and as role models, we have a, a big uh, part to play. And I think also just having the conversation really openly. And yeah. I like to think of this idea in, um, in everything, actually, when we know better, we do better. And I think yeah. if everybody has that idea of um, reflecting and 
when we, you know, when we have better ideas and better practices that we adopt them, that we don't stick with the status quo. Yeah. Janet, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And I can tell uh, I'm recording this on the second last day of the holidays. And I've done a lot <laughs> of interviews this holidays, but I'm also going to bump yours forward. So it, it will come out in a few weeks. And I extend my huge thanks and love to you for everything that you do and for being such a an ongoing source of inspiration for me and thank you uh, i'd say the same back to you jeff <laughs> thank you <laughs>